Okay, guys, welcome to week five. Uh, we're almost there. This week and next week, and we are done. So let's just get right to it. All right, so before we start on the newer things for this week, let's just review a couple things. Let's review the structures we talked about, homologous, analogous, and vestigial. So if you remember, homologous structures are structures that are anatomically similar. Okay, we looked at the, the bone patterns of, of limbs of mammals, of humans, of cats, of whales, and, um, and what was the other one? A bat, yeah. And uh, we looked at those patterns and we could see the, the anatomical similarities, and those point to common ancestry. Analogous structures are structures that are used for the same purpose, but aren't necessarily built in the same way and they don't show any common ancestry. So uh, the wing of a butterfly versus the wing of the bat. Built totally differently, um, out of different materials. Um, don't function the same way, but they do the same purpose. They're for flight. So those are analogous. And then vestigial structures are those reduced forms uh, of a structure that no longer serve a purpose in a modern species, but once did. And they can also show common ancestry. So now let's move on to genetic drift. So when we talk about genetic drift, we're going to talk about some of the concepts that we looked at earlier in the semester, specifically when we were studying genetics and how traits are passed down. So genetic drift is just when the allelic frequency of a population changes. If you remember, alleles are different forms of the same gene. So we looked at pea plants and, and talks about white flowers and purple flowers. So there's a gene for flower color, and there are different forms of that gene. Those are called alleles. So there's a purple allele. There's a white allele. So when those allelic frequencies change, that would be the percentage of those alleles that are present in a population. When that changes, that is called genetic drift. So let's look at two extreme examples. The first example would be something called the founder effect. And this is when you have a small portion of a population or like a sample of a population leave the original population. So if you think about when the United States was being colonized, um, segments of, of the population in Europe would move here so they would separate from that original population. So those new populations that moved here, the samples, um, they may have a different allelic frequency of certain traits than the original population back in Europe. And so as they move here and they're sort of isolated and start to reproduce some of those traits that aren't as common back where they came from are more common here um, in the new population because the founders of that population had a higher frequency of those traits. Another extreme example is called the bottleneck effect. And so this is when a population diminishes in size. And so for whatever reason, a population dwindles down, the population dwindles to becomes very small, but then it rebounds and grows again. And so if you think of a bottleneck, right, it comes in and then it goes back out a little bit so the population dwindles down, gets very small, and then rebounds and grows again. And so in this instance, what happens is the survivors in that population when it's at its lowest are the ones that have traits that have high fitness, that helps them survive. When whatever else was affecting the population caused it to shrink and dwindle down, these individuals survive. And so as the population rebounds and starts to grow again, whatever traits were common in the very small population become more common as the population grows. Now the problem with this is that sometimes these the population dwindles so much that these organisms um, become very closely related in terms of genetics so that um, they might even, might even appear inbred. And you see this in the cheetah population today. So scientists think that around 10,000 years ago, um, the cheetah population 
shrunk, dwindled, got very small, rebounded and grew again. And then we know that about 100 years ago, it happened again. It shrunk down, they were almost extinct, and then this rebounded again. They're still in danger, but what you see with modern cheetahs is, from a genetic standpoint, they appear to be inbred. They're so closely related genetically. And so this is the bottleneck effect. So let's look at the second question here, the next question. It says, explain how genetic traits are distributed throughout a population for each type of natural selection. So we're gonna look at stable selection, directional selection, disruptive selection, excuse me, and sexual selection. So stable selection is when of the varying forms of a trait, the population tends to move towards the, the median, the average form of a trait, and away from the extremes. Um, so the extreme traits don't have good fitness. The average trait, the intermediate trait, has good fitness. And so the population, um, the frequency of that trait shifts in that population towards the average and away from the extreme. And that's called stable selection. Then you have directional selection. This is when um, a trait in a population moves toward the extreme. So the extreme form becomes more common. And probably the most famous example of evolution in the real world um, that is talked about so much are, are the example of the moths. And so you have a certain species of moth. Let me see here, I'll get this right. The peppered moth, yeah. So the peppered moth and pre-industrial revolution in England, so before the industrial revolution happened, most of these moths were a grayish sort of peppered color about 95 percent of the population and they had very good camouflage with the trees that were local to that area and so they land on that tree they became camouflaged their predators couldn't see them very well but about five percent of the population had uh, completely black wings dark wings and so they were an extreme form of the trait the average form the normal form was that white peppered sort of look well, when the Industrial Revolution happened, um, they were burning a lot of coal in the area, and that coal dust settled on everything, including the trees. Now these light-colored moths, they really stuck out. And so the birds and other animals that, that would prey on these moths could see them easier. But what happened? The ones that were the darker color, now they blended in. So over the course of the next um, several decades, what happened to that population is it shifted from one extreme toward the other. So it moved away from the light colored to after the end of, of the next uh, 30, 40 years, what you had was a population that was almost completely black in color and there were almost no uh, uh, light colored moths left. And so that's directional selection. It moved in one direction towards one extreme. Disruptive selection um, is the next one. And it's when you, the population moves towards two different extremes, away from an average. And so you see this with certain species of snake, snakes, and as some of them moved inland, away from like the ocean, from the sea. Uh, their habitat changed. And so over time, the skin coloration that helped them blend into the rocky cliffs next to the ocean was no longer a trait that had high fitness. But the snakes that maybe were a little browner or greener that blended in with the grass or the dirt in the forest uh, further inland, now all of a sudden that trait had a higher fitness than it did when the habitat was different. And so as the population spread out, what you see is the two groups move towards the two extremes. And the snakes that live in the rocky habitat on the edge of the ocean, they have a grayish, um, blackish coloration that really blends in with those rocks well. And then the ones that are further inland have um, sort of matted brown um, appearance that helps them survive in their environment. 
And so that's disruptive. It's moving towards the two extremes. And finally, you have sexual selection. And this is when the traits that are selected for are specifically only relevant to attracting a mate. So if you think about a peacock, a male peacock, they walk around and sort of strut their feathers. Um, that's what that is. Those, the strutting around, the big elaborate display of feathers attracts mates. And so that trait was selected for over time. Um, and it only has to do with reproduction. It gives the animal no other um, advantage. If you want to see some really neat examples of this, you need to look up Birds of Paradise. Just Google Birds of Paradise um, and you will find some crazy videos of these birds and all the elaborate ways that they attract mates and it's pretty awesome. All right guys, one more week. Um, you're right here at the end. Um, as always, we love you. We miss you. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. All right, we'll see you guys.